All right, so let's get started. So in the previous lecture, we looked at the concept of representations. And the point where we left our discussion was that if we have some quantum state psi in a certain representation or in a certain basis, then the same state can also be represented in another representation. So the same physical state, get psi, could be represented in an infinite number of bases because you have your n-dimensional Hilbert space, there are an infinite number of representations that you can choose. So the same physical state, which is given by ket psi, can be written in one basis or in another basis. And how I have differentiated between these representations is, I've just put a tilde on top of the ket, where it's in a different basis, in a different representation. And the representation is transformed by a matrix which I call S. So the old basis is given by a set of basis vectors denoted as ket i and the state is written as a superposition of all of these basis states. Right. So ket psi is just a superposition of the ket i's with the corresponding probability amplitudes. But we, there is no harm in choosing a new basis. There is nothing special with this basis. You can choose a new basis <coughs> represented as i limit. And the same physical state, the same physical state which physically corresponds to the same object can be represented in this new basis by C i tilde ket i tilde for all the times. So this state ket psi and this state ket psi with a tilde over it are the same physical state. There is no physical distinction between these states. It's only that they will be represented differently. And if you want to transform from the old basis to the new basis, if you want to make this transformation, you have to multiply the vector in the old basis with the matrix S. If this is an n-dimensional Hilbert space, so is this. And this is an n by n matrix. And it's an operator that takes you from the old basis to the new basis. And this is what this operator is actually doing. Okay? And we've also noticed that this operator S, of course it will have n by n, n square elements. And the elements will be given by S11, S12, S1n, S21, S22, all the way up to Sn, uh, S2n, likewise Sn1, Sn2, all the way up to Snn. And each of these elements, the S i j element, we derived in the previous lecture is given by the inner product of the old and the new basis vectors. Mm -hmm. So each element of this matrix is given by this inner product. It represents the overlap of an old basis vector with a new basis vector. Okay? So this is something we've already derived. Let's look at an example. Suppose I have the <coughs> linearly polarized quantum state of a photon given by 45 degrees, linearly polarized state. 
Now, if I choose an old basis, which is given by cat A and cat B, then we all know that the Jones vector or the column vector, which is just a representation of this quantum state in this basis, is given by this 45 degrees is just given by 1 over and root 2, 1, 1. However, now what I would like to do, I would like to choose a new basis. I would like to represent the same physical state, the same quantum state. The state isn't changing. Still photons are coming in at 45 degrees polarization with respect to the lab axis. For example, with respect to the floor of this laboratory. So physically the state is still the same. But now I would like to represent the same state in a new basis. And I choose the basis to be say 45 degrees and 135 degrees. Okay, so this is my new basis. Okay, and in, in your mind you can make a mental map. The mental map is such that this is your old basis at 0 degrees and 90 degrees. This is the horizontal axis, this is the vertical axis and your new basis is this is at 45 degrees and this basis vector is at 125 degrees. But remember this is only to be taken as a mental map. Because these quantum states do not live in the real space. They live in the Hilbert space. So this is just a mnemonic. Something for you to remember and visualize. There is nothing real associated with this diagram. Just keep this in mind. Okay? Now if you would like to represent the same physical state in this basis, we would have to multiply this in its state with a transforming matrix, with an S matrix, which is also called a similarity transform, a similarity matrix. So we would have to construct the matrix. Now what we would like to do is we would like to decide on an ordering of states. In the old basis, we represent cat H by 1, 0 and cat B by 0, 1. Okay? So this is an ordering that we decide. And in the new basis, we would like this, the S matrix will simply be given by uh, so let's choose this to be the, to be at order number 1 in the new basis. Let's choose this sketch to be order number 1. So the first mat matrix element would be the overlap between 45 degrees and H. This element would be 45 degrees V. This element would be 135 degrees H. And this element would be 125 degrees V. This will give us the entire similarity matrix. Now we would, have, we would like to find out what these individual matrix elements are. We would have to find out the overlaps. And remember, it's a physical state. Get H is a physical polarization direction. Get 45 degrees represents a physical state. So no matter what basis you choose, this overlap or this inner product will remain unchanged. Okay? It's just like finding the projection between two real vectors which are pointing into fixed directions in the space. So whatever basis you choose, these elements will remain unchanged. So let's find out these elements. We know that 45 degrees can be written as the superposition of the old basis states, get H plus get B. Right? And we also know that 135 degrees can also be written as 1 over under root 2 minus cat H plus cat B, right? So, <coughs> this matrix element, this matrix element will simply be given by the corresponding rule of this vector, which is 1 over under root 2 cat H plus, or sorry, bra H plus bra B and its inner product with H. I get 1 over under root 2 as a result. If I find this element, it's also going to be 1 over under root 2. If I find this element, 
it's going to be minus 1 over under root 2. This element is going to be 1 over under root 2. So my S matrix is 1 over under root 2, 1, minus 1, 1, 1. Correct? So the 135 test Agar, if the basis state is along this axis, right? The amount, so this angle is theta. So you have cosine theta cat h plus sine theta cat b. But theta is 135, cosine of 135 is minus 1 over 2. So in general, light or photons that are polarized linearly at an angle theta with the horizontal, the general state is cosine theta get h plus sine theta get b. Okay. So this is your similarity transform. Now you take this representation, which is the old representation, you multiply that matrix with this representation, you get the new representation. So the physical state gets 45 degrees in the new representation is the same physical state. I'm not transforming the state. I'm just labeling it differently. I'm representing it differently because now my observation axes have changed. So this new state is going to be this operator. Multiplied with this initial representation. 1 over and 2. 1, 1. Again. 1 half. What should the output be? It should be a column vector because I'm getting a new I'm getting the same state in a different representation. So I carry out the multiplication, I get 2 here and I get 0 here. Does the answer make sense? Yes, it does. So in my shifted rotated, in my rotated frame of observation, I've changed the basis, which means that now this is no longer my x-axis, my horizontal axis or my reference axis has shifted by 45 degrees. So any polarization state that is parallel to this axis will be represented by 1, 0. So this is the 45 degrees polarized light in the new reference frame. In the revised basis is the same physical state but in a new representation. And there's nothing special with choosing cat H and cat B as the basis states. You can choose cat 45, cat 135. You can choose cat 45 minus 45. You can choose 30 degrees and 120 degrees as your basis states. There's an infinite variety of choices that you can make. And the same physical state can be represented in either of these bases. You just have to find out what the similarity transform looks like. Okay? Now let's look at another example. We've transformed states. We've changed the basis of states. Right? We've moved from old to new basis. What about the operators? Suppose I do draw two scenarios. I have a quantum state psi. It's acted upon by some operator. And I get a new state, psi dash. <coughs> okay? So, psi is represented in some basis, psi dash is represented, of course, in the same basis, and O has to be represented in some basis as well. Now, there's another creature, or a Martian creature, or someone who does not agree on this basis. You would like to publish your results in a paper, but in a different lab in the world, they choose a different reference frame. So what they would like to do, they would like to use their own representation, their own basis. So what they would do, they would represent the same physical state differently. Physically, it's the same state, but written in a new representation. Okay? And it's the same operator, but written in a new representation. Okay? And you get a new state, psi dash, which is identical to this state but written in a new representation. Okay? The physics should not change. So if in this reference frame the operator O acts on cat psi to give you psi dash, in this reference frame O 
tilde should act on psi tilde to give you psi dash tilde. The operator equation shouldn't change because physics is independent of the basis that you choose to represent your states and operators in. The outcomes of experiments cannot change depending upon what basis you choose. Only the representation can change. Physics is independent of the basis. Quantum mechanics should be basis independent. So now we've learned how to transform states. This is how you transform states. But how do we transform operators? Okay, this is something we would like to learn. So look at this expression. Now, psi dash tilde must equal O operator tilde acting upon psi tilde. But what is psi tilde? Psi tilde is simply the operator, the similarity operator x acting upon psi. Okay? So this is psi dash tilde. Right? So, instead of, I just replaced this psi tilde with operator s, which is the similarity transform acting on psi. Now what I would like to do, this psi dash tilde is actually equal to the operator s acting on psi dash. Okay. So I replace this psi dash tilde by the operator S acting on psi dash. So, if I look at this expression, are you with me up to this point? No? Is this clear? Operator O acts on the get to give you a transform state. Both of the input and the output are in the same representation. Okay? Now what I would like to do, I would like to, uh, I just change the ordering. I put this left hand side here and the right hand side here. Okay. Now what I do is I take this psi tilde. This psi tilde is the psi in the old basis being pre-multiplied by a similarity matrix. Okay. So this is the right hand side now. Okay. Now this psi dash tilde which is the final state in the new basis is just the final state in the old basis multiplied by the similarity transform. Because it is this matrix S that is taking you from the old to the new basis. 
यहां पे समझ आ गई बात सर साई प्राइम ओल्ड बेसिस में साई प्राइम ओल्ड बेसिस में और टिल डेज आर इन द न्यू बेसिस ऑल द टिल डेज आर इन द न्यू बेसिस दिस इज द न्यू बेसिस दिस इज द सेम एक्शन इन द ओल्ड बेसिस और इससे ये सिमिलरिटी मैट्रिक्स है इसको हम मल्टीप्लाई करते हैं साई प्राइम पे साइन कर देते हैं The similarity transform takes you from this basis to this basis. So what you do is you you can multiply this vector with s. You will get psi tilde. You can multiply this vector with s. You can get the tilde version of this vector. Okay. So s just takes you from this basis to this basis. Okay. Now what we would like to do? What operation should we apply to the operator? That's the goal. So now we have this representation. We have this operator equation. Are you with me on this? Now this is an operator. This is an operator, and so is this an operator. Okay. Now every operator has an inverse. Every physically meaningful operator has an inverse. So what I would like to do, I would like to multiply both sides by the inverse of s, psi dash equals s inverse o s psi. Okay. Now what does this give me? What is the result of this multiplication? Identity. It's identity. So I can leave out the operator psi dash. The transformed state equals s inverse o operator in the new basis s. Okay. But we know that psi dash. Must equal the operator acting upon psi. This is this was our starting point. Hence, this operator should be equal to this operator. Hence, the operator in the old basis must equal the operator in the new basis pre-multiplied by the inverse of s. And post multiplied by the similarity matrix itself. Okay. I could now multiply both pre-multiply both sides by s and post multiply by s inverse, and I would get the operator. So I get s here. I can put s minus one or the inverse of s here. I would get this. All right. So I can go from one basis to another, both for states and for operators. If I have a state phi in some basis, I can go to a new basis by multiplying this phi by a similarity transform. And if I have an operator O in some basis, I can go to a new basis by pre-multiplying by S. And post multiplied by the inverse of s. Okay, you just have to remember these expressions. Either one of them. I will give these expressions to you in the exam or quizzes, but you should be familiar with this. So notice one thing: if you have a state, you just pre-multiply it with an operator, with a similarity operator, to get the new, to get the same state in a new basis. However, for operators, you will have to do a pre and a post multiplication. This is something very important to realize. For example, let's look at a horizontal wave plane. Okay. Now, what the horizontal wave plane does, if its fast axis is along x, right, along h, right. Suppose its fast axis is along h. Right? We've already noted that its transforming matrix is given by one, zero, 
0 minus 1, right? Now suppose what I physically do is I rotate this half wave plate. I physically rotate it. Now, and I rotate it suppose by 45 degrees. Suppose I take this physical object, which is a piece of optics, and I rotate it by 45 degrees, so that my fast axis now comes here, right? This is now my fast axis, which is at 45 degrees with respect to the horizontal. And the horizontal is with respect to the <coughs> with respect to the real world. So I'm taking a physical element which has a certain operator description and I'm physically rotating it. Now if I also rotate my frame of reference, if I call this to be the horizontal axis, say, what would be the operator description of this same element? It's going to be the same. However, when I'm doing the experiment, I would like to input horizontally polarized light. I would like to represent this operator in the old basis so that I'm consistent. So my operator in the new basis for this particular example is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And I would like to find out what is the operator description of this rotating half wave plate in the original axis that I chose. Right? This is my task. So I, I have O tilde, which should be, it should just be this, and I would like to find out this. Uh, this the same operator, the same operation in the old basis. Okay? So once again, my old basis vectors are, are represented like this, and my new basis vectors are represented like this, and this is my transformation matrix. And what I would like to do now for the half wave plate that is rotated at 25 degrees. Quantum knot gate. Yes, it's like a knot gate, a quantum knot gate. Which transforms ket H to ket B and ket B to ket H. So now what we've done, we've come up with a mathematical framework of how to transform from an old state, old basis representation to a new basis representation. And we can do this for kets and we can do this for operators. 
And this process is called similarity transformation. Any questions? This should be O. This should be O to me. Why is it O to me? This should be O. This is one. The matrix 1, 0, 0, minus 1 should be O. Should be O to me. No. Is it O to the new matrix? Yeah, O to me is... What, what have you done? You've changed your basis. You've changed your axis. Okay? Now the operator in the new basis is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. If this were your reference axis, <coughs> what you've done is you've moved your reference axis and you've moved your polarizer in tandem with the reference axis. Both the polarizer or the half wave plane and the reference axis are moved together. So effectively, for as far as the operator is concerned, nothing has changed. Okay? If you're observing me and I'm walking at a certain pace and the observer is also walking with, with me at the same pace, Effectively, my operator description or my state description doesn't change. This is what is happening here. I physically rotated the half wave plate and I physically rotated the frame of reference so that the operator description in the rotated frame of reference hasn't changed. So this is rotated. Okay? And what I would like to find out, suppose I still want to use the horizontal axis of the laboratory as my reference frame because everything is calibrated with respect to that. So in that old reference frame, my operator would be given by O, right? So you have to be careful as to what do you really mean by the old and the new basis. You have to think carefully. Alright, so this operation, the inverse of an operator. Suppose I have a unitary matrix U. And I find its inverse. Its inverse is simply equal to the adjoint of this operator. Okay? What is such an operator called? Permission. It's called a unitary operator. And the unitary operator, physically it corresponds to rotations. Okay? Can you visualize that the change of basis is actually a rotation. Right? So this operator S, this similarity matrix, this similarity operation should also be unitary. Okay? We have to prove that. For unitary matrices, finding the inverse is really easy. You can just find the adjoint. And what is the adjoint? It's just finding the transpose and taking the complex conjugate at every element. Okay? So if I have a matrix U and I would like to find its adjoint, then its ij element is simply going to be equal to the j ith element of U and its complex conjugate. Right? This is what is meant by an adjoint. Okay. So the first index refers to the row number, the second index refers to the column number. If I interchange the indices, it corresponds to the element in the transpose. And this complex conjugation shows what, what I just said. So this is the definition of an adjoint. Okay. Now what I would like to prove is that this similarity transform, this matrix is unitary. Okay. Now our mathematical sophistication and finesse is going to build up gradually. Okay? So you have to be cognizant of this. S is an operator and you would like to prove that S is unitary. So what we would really like to prove is that if I take S and its adjoint and multiply it with S, it gives me identity. This is what I have to do. Now the left hand side is a product of two matrices. Okay? And we know that the product of two matrices 
right? A first matrix and the second matrix can be decomposed in a certain representation in this fashion, I, J, J, K, and if I sum over all of J, what do I get? I get an element, right, in the product. Okay. I get the, which element do I get? I get the i k element in the product. Okay. So, let's call this product P. Okay. So, I get the i k element in the product. Do you understand this? Does anyone not understand this? So you know, I have to add your column K fill. If I have M, N, two matrices giving me P, okay, of the same order, a certain element in P, right? Indexed by i and k. i is the row number, k is the column number. This will be given by m, i, j, m, j, k, sum over all j. Okay? Let's show, show this. Suppose m is a 2 by 2 matrix, n is a 2 by 2 matrix. m, the elements of m are m11, m12, M21, M22, N11, N12, M21, N22, right? My product is matrix P with elements P11, P12, P13, P21, P22, right? Now, what is this element equal to? This element is equal to this M11 being multiplied by this plus this M12 being multiplied by this. So, P11 is just equal to M11 N11 plus M12 multiplied by M21. So, if I would like to write this in shorthand, the first index P is 1. So, I take all the n's in the first row. So, m1 something, m1 something. The second element in P, the column uh, number is 1. So, I take n something 1, n something 1. And I iterate the indices that are sandwiched between m and n. So this one is being sandwiched and I iterate it. I use all the possible values of this sandwiched index. This one, it's one here and it's a two here. But the initial and the final indices. So this one, which I underlined in blue, corresponds to this one and this one. This one corresponds to this one and this one. And the index in between, it's identical number on the two matrices and it's iterated over all the possible combination. And this is just a shorthand way of writing what I've said. You can check this out for all the other elements. This is what matrix multiplication means. This is the meaning of matrix multiplication. This is how you do the mechanics. It's just notation and it's beautiful compact notation for matrix multiplication. So likewise, I have exactly trans, uh, transmuted this notation and I am using exactly the same notation here. I want to find a particular element in the product that, which has row number i, column number k. So I take the first matrix i at row, the second matrix k at column and this index j is identical on the two matrices for which I am finding the product and it is iterated. Okay, so this is just one way of writing this expression. I am just performing the matrix multiplication. Now what we know is 
that S J K is an element which is given by J tilde K, right? Now, what we would like, what we are interested in is knowing is S at joint, we are interested in knowing the I K I J element of S at joint. <coughs> Isn't this equal to S J I star? This is what is meant by net joint. Okay. You just reverse the order of the indices and take the complex conjugate. Okay. So S S dagger I J column of S dagger is simply J ith element of S and its complex conjugate. But what is the J ith element of S? It's simply J tilde in a product with I and its complex conjugate. Okay? Agree? This is how you define the similarity transform. This is what you derived already. S J I with the complex conjugate is just the inner product of the new element j with a tilde and the old element i without a tilde, right? Remember this? I put k here, I get k here, I put l here, I get l here. Just indices. Okay? Agree? Samajai? Asad? Yes. So here? A question. नहीं ये समझ लेंगे नहीं अगर रोटेशन के अलावा ट्रांसलेशन भी होती है यार इतना आ गया ना क्यों फिर सर वो फिर फिर वो और सिमिलरिटी ट्रांसफॉर्म हो सिमिलरिटी ट्रांसफॉर्म और तरह की वो मेंटल मोपरेट करो पढ़ें क्या साइज ठीक है यहाँ तक बात समझा सकते हैं जैन तुम जैन अब देखो अब किस ये एलिमेंट है ना अगर विदाउट डी कॉम्प्लेक्स कॉन्जुगेट इट्स जस्ट अ स्केलर इट्स जस्ट अ कॉम्प्लेक्स नंबर एंड इट्स कॉम्प्लेक्स कॉन्जुगेट इज सिंपली यू जस्ट रिवर्स डी कैट एंड डी ब्रा है नो लेट्स यूज दिस एक्सप्रेशन इज एवरीवन कंफर्टेबल विद दिस Now what you would like to do is you just put this in here and P i k is the i k element of the product. This turns out to be equal to sum over all of j <coughs> i j and s j k which is simply j divided. What this this sum is going to be equal to? <laughs> now all the j's, the j tildes form a basis. So could you tell me what the sum is going to be equal to? Let's check this out. If I have a basis, if I have a quantum state psi, right? If I have a quantum state psi in an n-dimensional space, then this state can be represented as the inner product of psi with all the i's, where i's are the basis states, k i. Sum over all of j. 
summed over all of i's. Correct? This is just the probability amplitude. Okay. Now I rewrite this in a different fashion. I. Now this is a number, so it's porous. I can move it to the end. Sorry. Okay. All right. Now this doesn't depend upon i. This is the state that doesn't depend upon i. I can put all all of this in brackets. This out of product in brackets and psi. But this must equal to psi itself. So what should this expression be equal to? Neelam, your name is Neelam? Naila. What is this expression equal to? This this pink expression. One? What, what's the meaning of one? Identity mean. Is this an operator? Yes. Yes. It's a sum of operators, sum of outer product. So it's not a scalar. It's an operator and that operator is just the identity. Because this has to be equal to the state itself. The state is being acted upon by an operator to give you this. So this must equal the identity. So the identity can always be written as a sum of out of products, where the sum is over all the basis states. Okay. Likewise, this expression is just a sum over all the basis states, albeit in the new basis. It doesn't matter whether it's the new basis or, or the old basis. These j tildes in the new basis also define a complete set, take the form of basis. So what should this expression be equal to? Identity. identity. It must equal identity. So when this equals identity, what happens?
couple of minutes just to think over this. What is doing is taking you from an old to a new basis. Okay? And what we are proving is that S dagger is equal to S inverse. That's what we are doing. So if O in the new basis an operator is equal to S O in the old basis S inverse, right? Compute, remember, okay, so no bad. Bad so no. Computing the inverse is mechanistically or calculationally more difficult. Slightly more difficult. Computing the adjoint is easier because you just have to take the task force and find the complex conjugate of each element. Hence, this S O S inverse could be written as S O S dagger. Whenever you have a unitary matrix, you can either use the inverse or the or the dagger adjoint. It's the same thing because it's a unitary matrix. So the similarity transform is a unitary matrix. Alright, so it's a good time for a break. Let's meet at 10 past 6. Hermitian operator in a particular <coughs> basis, 
that which means I am writing a matrix. Representing an operator in a basis means that I am being able to write a matrix for it. Now, if this condition is to be satisfied, then it simply means that this element has to be the complex conjugate of this element. So, these elements are complex conjugates of one another. Right? It's clear from here. So, a i j the element, the element in the first row, second column must be equal to the complex conjugate of the element in the second row and the first column. So it's not really symmetric because symmetric matrices means that B equals C. What we mean here is that B's complex conjugate equals C. And C's complex conjugate equals B. Okay? So this is what a Herbitian matrix really is. And it has <coughs> certain useful properties, immensely important properties. Another example of a matrix is a matrix A whose end joint equals the, the negative of the original matrix. This is called an anti Hermitian matrix. Alright? So, Hermitian matrices have immense uses in quantum mechanics. They are the cornerstone of measurement theory. They are the cornerstone of how quantum mechanics works. But before we delve into their applications to quantum mechanics, we we'll have to look at some of their mathematical properties. Yes. Uh, just with the Hermitian operator is just that is that conjugate is equal to the original operator. Sorry? It's the it's the adjoint. The adjoint is not the same as the complex conjugate of an operator. Okay. Minus A is minus A Minus A. A if A dagger equals minus A is anti Hermitian. If A dagger equals A is Hermitian. Alright. Now a few important properties. First of all, if I have a matrix M. Now, you can think that matrices are really operators. In linear algebra, if this operator were to act on a vector, okay, and you would get the vector back again with some scalar, could be a complex number, then this vector is called an eigenvector of the matrix. <coughs> okay. You've also read that. And this number is called the eigenvector value. So an operator acting on its eigenstate returns the eigenstate even though it can pick up a certain number. Okay. This number could be unity, this could be complex, it could be any number. Okay. It's, but it has to be scalar. Likewise, if I have an operator A, okay, and this operator is Hermitian and it acts on the quantum state of psi. Okay. If I get psi back again with some complex number A, remember complex numbers permeate quantum mechanics. All the numbers I'm talking about are in general complex. It could be real, it could be magic, but in general they're complex. So this A is a complex number. So if an operator acts on a state and returns the state, then this state is an eigenvector of the operator. Okay. In your book, if I take uh, A to be an operator and I represent the eigen state by delta, by lambda, sorry, lambda i. Okay. If I get the original state, even though with some complex number as a coefficient, then this is called an eigenvalue equation. This number is called the eigenvalue, and this state is an eigenstate or an eigen or an eigenvector of this 
permission operator. Okay, so this is an eigenvalue equation, and you are representing the eigenvalue and the eigenstate by the same label. You just putting the for the state, you just putting the label inside the ket notation. Agree? Now, if I take the dual of this expression, let's first take the dual of the right hand, left hand side. This ket becomes a bra. This operator is replaced by its adjoint, but the adjoint is the operator itself because it's a Hermitian operator, right? The a value equals a, and if I take the dual of this right hand side, this can becomes a bra, and this must be replaced by its complex conjugate. This number must be replaced by its complex conjugate. Lambda i star. Now the first property, most important property of eigen of Hermitian operators, is that its eigen values are real. For an Hermitian operator which eigenvalues are real. And this gives us some solace. Because when we have real eigenvalues, we don't have to worry about the conceptual difficulties of what a complex number really is in experiments. In experiments, you always measure real numbers. Your ammeter gives you a current in real numbers, three amperes. A voltmeter gives you a current, a, a voltage in real numbers. You don't have to worry about the com conceptual abstractions that are intermixed with the idea of a complex number. So the eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator are real and this gives us some solace. We have to prove that the eigenvalues are real. Let's prove this. Okay. Now A is a Hermitian operator acting on its eigen state. There could be many eigenstates. Okay? Up to n. If it's in an n-dimensional space, there could be n eigenstates. Suppose it acts on an eigenstate to give you lambda i is the eigenvalue and this is the eigenstate. Okay. Now if I take the inner product of this equation with the state itself, the same state. Now this is a number, lambda i, lambda i, right? Now what is this equal to? If these eigenstates are normalized, what is this equal to? Lambda i. Lambda i. Lambda i. Lambda i. Lambda i. Okay? This is equation number one. Okay? Now I take the dual of this equation. The left hand side becomes the bra lambda i acted upon by adjoint of a. But the adjoint of a is a itself because it's an emission operator. Lambda i acted upon from the right by a. And what is the dual of this vector? It's bra lambda i. And this number is replaced by its complex conjugate. Okay? Now I take the inner product of this bra with the cat. Lambda i a I introduce this cat, <coughs> therefore I have to take the inner product of this with the corresponding cat. But what is this equal to? One. Lambda i star number two. Now this expression is exactly equal to this expression. Hence, this right hand side must equal this right hand side, which means lambda i star must equal lambda i. The complex conjugate of the eigenvalue must equal the number itself. <coughs> what does this mean? The number is real. It doesn't have an imaginary part. 
So irrespective of the I, whatever eigenstate we choose of a Hermitian operator, the eigenvalue is real. All the eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator are real. Okay, it's a very important property of emission operators. I give you one minute just to note this down when I have a glass of water. The taste of this statement lies in eating the pudding. So let's prove it first and then you'll understand what really means. Okay. Suppose I have a Hermitian operator A. I act upon it. Uh, it acts upon an eigenstate lambda i to give me lambda i cat lambda i, right? Now I take its inner product with the state lambda j. Okay? Lambda j. j can be different from i. A lambda i lambda i lambda j in a product with lambda i. Okay? This is number one. Now I take this expression and find its dual. Bra lambda i acted upon from the right by a dagger, but a dagger is simply a. Right? This must equal lambda i star bra lambda i. But this operation, A is acting on lambda j. Okay. 
Now this is a, is this a complex number? Yes. Yes, it's a complex number. If I I can take the complex conjugate of both sides, right? It doesn't harm if I take the complex conjugate of both sides. Now if I take this left hand side, its complex conjugate is simply going to be lambda j a dagger lambda i. This is what the complex conjugate really means. It just interchanges the cat with the bra and you get the <coughs> adjoint of A. But the adjoint of A is A itself. Okay? And you get lambda j star. And what's the complex conjugate of this number? You swap. Lambda j, lambda i. This is equation number 2. Now I have equation number 1 and I have equation number 2 and I subtract the two equations. This is exactly identical to this. So if I subtract the left hand side, what do I get? 0. And if I subtract the right hand side, what do I get? I get lambda i minus lambda j star. But is lambda j star equal to lambda j? Yes. yes, because it's an eigenvalue of an emission operator. So 0 equals lambda i minus lambda j into the inner product lambda j and lambda i. Now what does this tell you? If these eigenvalues for i and j are different, which means the eigenvalues are distinct, then this number cannot be equal to 0. So this number has to be equal to 0. So when this inner product is 0, it means lambda j and lambda i are orthogonal. So if we have two eigenvectors whose eigenvalues, the corresponding eigenvalues are distinct, these are called degenerate eigenvalues in quantum mechanics. Degenerate eigenvalues. So for a Hermitian operator, the eigenvectors corresponding to degenerate eigenvalues must be orthogonal. I give you a couple of minutes to just think about this. Alright, so I'll repeat. Are you clear with me on this? A is acting on lambda i. First note this down for a minute and then I'll re explain what about that thing. मुझे दोबारा मैं आपको बोलूँगा आपसे एक मिनट का पूछ लेते हैं। A is an emission operator acting on its eigenstate. I recover the eigenstate with the corresponding eigenvalue. I take the inner product with lambda j, I get this expression. Okay. I get a number here. This is a number, a raw shear number, a scalar. Now I act A on another eigenstate, lambda j. I get the same state because it's an eigenstate with an eigenvalue lambda j. Could be different, <coughs> could be the same as well. These numbers could be the same or different. If they are the same, they're called degenerate. If they're not the same, they're called non-degenerate. <coughs> if these eigenvalues are the same, then these states are called degenerate states. Okay. If these numbers, lambda i and lambda j, are the same, then these states are called degenerate states. And these numbers are called degenerate eigenvalues. Okay. So now I take, I act A on lambda j. Then I find the inner product with lambda i. Okay. 
Then I find the complex conjugate of this number. If I get the complex conjugate of this number, I get I swap the cat with the bra and take the adjoint of A, but the adjoint of A is A itself because the Hermitian operator. The complex conjugate of lambda j is lambda j star, and I swap these to get lambda j. Okay. Now this is my equation. Two. I subtract two from one. The left hand sides are identical. I get zero here. I get lambda i minus lambda j star here, but lambda j star is just lambda j because it's the eigenvalue of a Hermitian operator. If lambda i is not equal to lambda j, which means I have a non-degenerate, I have non-degenerate states, then this number cannot be equal to zero. Hence, this must be zero. And when these eigenstates corresponding to distinct eigenvalues Given inner product is zero, means that these states are orthogonal. Hence, for a Hermitian operator, the eigenvalues are real numbers, and the corresponding eigenstates, which means the non-degenerate eigenstates, must be orthogonal. Mm -hmm. Sir, so, I will do a Hermitian operator. Say so the eigenvalue is different. It's given to the mass of the Operators are orthogonality ki baat hu. Is it states of Other a Hermitian operator hai aur uski eigenvalues distinct hai. To uski eigenstates hamesha orthogonal hongi. Agar distinct nahi hai to orthogonal Ma'am ye bata rahi hu ki so point. Sir, Point number three. A acts on lambda i to give me some lambda i. Lambda i, right? Lambda i is therefore an eigenstate of A. Suppose A also acts on lambda j, which is also an eigenstate of A, but my eigenvalue is still lambda i. The eigenstate is lambda j, but the eigenvalue doesn't change. So two different eigenstates can have the same eigenvalue. No. These are distinct states but the same eigenvalues. Let's call both of these eigenvalues lambda i equals lambda j. Let's call both of these lambda. So this is lambda, lambda i. And this is lambda, lambda j. So different eigenstates, physically distinct eigenstates with, with the same eigenvalue. These eigenstates are called degenerate states because they have the same eigenvalue. And in general, lambda i and lambda j are not orthogonal. <coughs> okay. For these degenerate eigenstates. Eigen 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 Sorry? The second equation is eigenvalue j. J okay in lambda j equals lambda j. Lambda j and lambda i are equal, both of them are equal to lambda. Okay? So if this is the case, for degenerate eigenstates, the eigenstates are not necessarily orthogonal. But they can be orthogonal. They can be made to be orthogonal, that's what I'm going to tell you now. Now for degenerate eigenstates, Common eigenvalue lambda, right? If lambda i is an eigenstate and lambda j is an eigenstate with a common eigenvalue, then lambda i 
with some ci, some complex number, a probability amplitude, plus c j lambda j, right? Then this superposition of the eigenstates will also be an eigenstate of A. A will act on this superposition of these degenerate eigenstates. The result will be, of course, if this is a, an eigenstate, the result must be equal to this eigenstate, but with an eigenvalue. The eigenvalue is still going to be lambda, and the state remains unchanged. You understand? If lambda i is an eigenstate, lambda j is an eigenstate, sharing the same common eigenvalue, the eigenvalues are the same, then any linear superposition of these eigenstates, any linear superposition, will also be an eigenstate of the operator. And from this one can prove, though it's beyond the scope of this course, that one can choose these ci's to be such that lambda i and lambda j can be made, that one can choose a superposition such that lambda i's and lambda j's, okay. One can always find a linear combination of states which are mutually orthogonal. One can always find even for degenerate eigenstates, states that are orthogonal. If you have an orthogonal set of states, which are also normalized, okay. then they form a basis. Can you think? If I have lambda i and lambda j eigenstates which are degenerate, one can always choose a linear combination which is also an eigen any linear combination will also be an eigenstate. And one can always choose two states with the same eigenvalue such that they are orthogonal. Therefore one can by design choose orthogonal states and we have exercises for this. Hence, one can always choose a set of eigenstates lambda i which are orthogonal for Hermitian operators which are normalized and <coughs> form a complete set. Complete set means that any state can be written as a superposition of any quantum state in the same dimensions of the Hilbert space can be written as a superposition of these eigenstates. Any state. Which means any lambda can always be written as a superposition of the lambda i's with certain coefficients. Okay, so I would like to stop here. I'd like to stop here so that you can absorb what I've taught and I'll take up this point in the next lecture and we'll look at some practical experiments.